Appendix to Mister of Mystery, a primer of Thelemic ecclesiastical Gnosticism. Gnostic Saints. Fifteen through twenty-two. Wolfgang von Goethe. Adam Weishaupt. Molinos. Elias Ashmole, Thomas Vaughn, Sir Edward Kelly, Johannes De. Wolfgang von Goethe, Johann. Wolfgang von Goethe, or in Arabic, Gauth. The Gauth is known amongst Theosophists as Sanat Kumara and the Arabs as the Axis Mundi or the Qutb. 1749 to 1832, Er Vogadis, by Tao Apirion. German novelist, playwright, poet, critic, journalist, painter, theater manager, statesman, educationalist, lawyer, scientist, philosopher, alchemist, mystic, and Freemason. He was a true Renaissance man, a success at all his vocations and avocations, but he was indisputably one of the greatest authors and poets of all time. The best known of his many works are Wilhelm Meister, Lerjehe, Master William's Year of Learning, 1821, Die Leiden des Jungen Werther, The Sorrows of Young Werther, 1774, Dicton und Wurheit, Poetry and Truth, 1811, and his masterpiece, Faust, published posthumously, 1832. Faust is universally recognized as one of the supreme achievements in all of literature. Goethe poured the entire vast reservoir of his wisdom and talent into the semi-autobiographical work which deals with the spirit of Western man, the dualistic dilemma between spiritual longing and sensual desires, aspiration and indulgence, and the drive for access to the infinite through knowledge. Faust is based on the legend of Dr. Faustus, also popularized by Chris Christopher Marlowe. Although there apparently was an historical Dr. Faustus, John Faustus of Wittenberg, circa 1520 Erovo his mythical life story appears to have been built upon events from the lives of three other more well-known men, Paracelsus, Johannes Heidenberg von Trichheim, also known as Trithemius, the abbot of the Benedictine monastery of Sponheim, who was one of Paracelsus' teachers, and Henry Cornelius Agrippa von Nettisheim, a Kabbalist and Neoplatonist, a contemporary of Paracelsus, and his fellow student of Trithemius and Rishulin. Ariochlin. In part one of Faust, we find the devil under the name Mephistopheles. P. 
paying a visit to the Lord to chide him over the miserable condition of his creation. The Lord counters with the example of his favorite servant, the Dr. Faust. Mephistopheles wagers that Faust, too, will fall into corruption if he would only be allowed to spend some time with him. The Lord reminds Mephistopheles that his policy is not to interfere with the earthly enterprises of Mephistopheles. We next find Faust, a medieval physician, lawyer, and theologian who has become frustrated with the emptiness of conventional learning and religion and who longs for more direct and who longs for a more direct communion with the real knowledge of nature conventional studies have failed him he turns to magic he invokes the spirit of earth who shows him even more clearly his divided divine earthly nature two souls alas are housed within my breast and each will wrestle for the mastery there. The one has passions craving crude for love and hugs a world where sweet the senses rage. The other longs for pastors fair above, leaving the murk for lofty heritage. His despair of the futility of his scholarly pursuits to free him from the restrictions of earthly life drives him to the brink of suicide, but he is unable to complete the final step. Having pursued the world of spirit all his life, he now yearns to fully experience the joys and sorrows of the earth. He visits the town, where he is lauded by the people as their benefactor, but he realizes how little he deserves their praise, for his accomplishments have all been trivial or illusory. He is visited by a dog, which presently transforms itself into Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles proposes to offer Faust all he may wish in life, if Faust will be his servant thereafter. Faust agrees but sets his own condition that Mephistopheles may only take him if he actually becomes contented with the things of the world. The bargain is made. A student visits, and Mephistopheles discourses ironically on learning. Faust and Mephistopheles then visit a tavern, where Mephistopheles toys with the patrons. They leave in disgust and consult a witch who gives Faust a portion, a potion to restore his youth. Mephistopheles then assists Faust to seduce a young girl named Margaret or Gretchen. Her brother, Valentine, discovers the affair and challenges Faust to a duel, which Faust wins. Valentine dies in Gretchen's arms, cursing her. Unaware of this, Faust is taken by Mephistopheles to the wild celebration of Walpurgisnacht. Walpurgis On the Brocken in the Hartz Mountains, at the conclusion of the festivities, Faust discovers that Gretchen has been thrown into prison for killing her newborn child. They return and visit her in prison, where she dies. Part 2 of Faust, while continuing the story of Faust and Mephistopheles, is more allegorical and symbolic than Part 1. Faust and Mephistopheles visit the court of a medieval emperor who is on the verge of losing his rule. Mephistopheles comes to his aid with the invention of paper money and Faust is charged to conjure up Helen of Troy as an entertainment. He falls in love with the ephemeral spirit of Helena. 
the perfect realization of idealized beauty. She vanishes at his touch, and he falls unconscious. Mephistopheles carries him off to his old study, where his former student Wagner has created, through an alchemical operation, a homunculus, a tiny human being encased within a glass vial. Mephistopheles conveys Faust and homunculus back in time to the classical Waterbrookus night, where they each may seek their desire. Faust his Helena, and homunculus his incarnation. After a series of encounters with various figures of myth, homunculus is carried to the sea, where he dashes himself against the throne of the beautiful Galatia. Faust's quest ends in his union with Helena and the birth of their child, Euphorion, who flies rashly up to the sun, only to fall back into the sea like Icarus. Helena, in grief, returns to her proper place in time. Faust and Mephistopheles return to the domain of the emperor, who is now challenged by a revolution. Mephistopheles assures victory to the emperor by providing him with a ghostly army. After the battle is won, Faust devotes his abilities to a great project, the reclaiming of a large tract of land from the sea. Near the completion of the project, Faust is again in old age. In order to complete the reclamation project, Faust commands that an old couple be relocated from their cottage to a new home, which has been prepared for them. Unfortunately, they refuse to go, and Faust's men end up burning down the cottage with the old couple inside it. Faust is again struck by the futility of his efforts, even with the aid of magic. He is near death. His labors have resulted in disaster, and he is no closer to personal freedom. However, he refuses to be defeated by care, and in his final moments, he realizes the true nature of freedom. Mephistopheles conjures his devils to capture Faust's soul as it escapes, but a band of angels arrives. Mephistopheles is distracted by the beauty of the angels, and the soul of Faust escapes him. The angels bear Faust's soul into a high mountain valley, where, surrounded by saints, angels, and mystic spirits, the soul of Gretchen arrives to serve as Faust's guide into the ultimate regions of heaven. Goethe's aim as an artist was always to uplift and liberate the human race. His wisdom grew out of a deep capacity for observation and introspection, and a mind that was never closed. His broad knowledge of diverse sciences and cultures enabled him to be an occultist without being superstitious, and religious without being sectarian. Though he never claimed to be a Rosicrucian, he deserved the appellation far more than most of those who did or do. References Benton William, Publisher, Encyclopedia Britannica, 1768, 1973. Mackenzie Kenneth, The Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, 1877, Aquarian Press, Wellingboro, 1987. Patcher Henry M., Magic into Science, The Story of Paracelsus, Henry Schumann, New York, 1951. Goethe or Rauth, 
Johann Wolfgang von Faust, a dramatic poem, translated and introduced by Anna Swanwick, A. L. Bert Co., New York, Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Faust, Part 1, translated by Philip Wayne, Harmonsworth, and Baltimore, 1960, MacDonald, William J., Editor-in-Chief, New Catholic Encyclopedia, McGraw-Hill, New York, 1967. Willoughby, L.A., Goethe, and Man, Myth, and Magic, Richard Cavendish, a relative of mine, Editor-in-Chief, Marshall Cavendish, New York, 1983. Original publication date, 1995. Updated 2197. Originally published in Red Flame, number two, Mystery of Mystery, a primer of Thelemic Ecclesiastical Gnosticism by Tal Apirion and Helena, Berkeley, California, 1995. Er Vogatis. Our next saint. is the Illuminatian, Adam Weishaupt, most worshipful, 1748 to 1811, Error Volga, Vital Apirion, German educator, Freemason, and founder of the Order of Illuminati. Crowley considered him to be a master of the temple. Weishaupt was educated by the Jesuits, but later became their bitter enemy. He was given the position of professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt, Bavaria in 1775, and was the first non-ecclesiastic to hold that position. The most common way to become the bitter enemy of the Jesuits is to be rejected by them. Weishaupt's humanistic system of Illuminism and his order of the Illuminati emerged from a small group of anti-royalist, anti-clerical students Weishaupt had established at Ingolstadt. After he became a Freemason in 1777, he began to work towards incorporating his system of Illuminism into that of Masonry, with the aim of extending his social ideals throughout the world. For a time, the Illuminati exercised a considerable amount of influence, but ultimately ended in failure largely due to vehement ecclesiastical persecution, coupled with the incompetence of many of Weishaupt's disciples. He was banished from Bavaria in 1784 and spent the remainder of his life as a guest of the Duke of Gotha, where he wrote, a picture of the Illuminati, 1786, a complete history of the persecution of the Illuminati in Bavaria, 1786, an apology for the Illuminati, 1776 plus 10, and an improved system of the Illuminati, 1787. Most of Weishaupt's biographers, including Baruel and Robinson, have been ecclesiastical or royalist partisans and have therefore vilified and slandered him. References Mackenzie Kenneth, The Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, Aquarian Press, Willingboro, 1987. Mackey, Albert G., Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, 
Masonic History Co., New York, 1909, Robinson, John, Proofs of a Conspiracy, 1798, Americanist Classics, Los Angeles, 1967. There is a tab for additional information. And it leads to italianopera.org forward slash Weishaupt, W-E-I-S-H-A-U-P-T, forward slash Weishaupt 00, W-E-I-S-H-A-U-P-T 00, dot HTML. And I'll play a bit, possible. Martia Degla Illuminati. I will add the file of possible at the end of the Seven Saints. By Giovanni Simon Meyer, Nom de Re Aristotle, Arustut. Arrangement copyright by BIA at Italian Opera, 2001. And here, from Google Translated Italian, if I can get it again. Uh, it says, Adam Weishaupt, born in Ingolstadt on February 6, 1748, is the leading man of the Illuminati and the brain behind the order which he founded in 1776 when he was only 28 years old. The association of which I have been speaking is the Order of Illuminati, founded in 1775 by Dr. Adam Weishaupt, 
professor of canon law in the University of Ingolstadt and abolished in 1786 by the Elector of Bavaria, but revived immediately after under another name and in a different form all over Germany. It was again detected and seemingly broken up, but it had by this time taken so deep root that it still subsists without being detected and has spread into all the countries of Europe. Robeson. Weishaupt had followed the teaching of Baron Johann Adam Ixtet, who had directed him to the Jesuit College, the same school as de Bessels, and the one that Mayer would later attend. Ixtet became curator of the University of Ingolstadt from 1742 a position he held until 1765, when he retired and Weishaupt had access to his private books, also becoming interested in French philosophical works, especially by Voltaire, 1694 to 1778. The latter demonstrated radical views, which he expounded in a letter to Frederick II. Finally, when the body of the church is sufficiently weakened in infidelity strong enough, the decisive blow will be hurled with the sword of complete and endless persecution. A reign of terror will dominate the earth and will continue until a Christian is so stubborn as to adhere to Christianity. The, the intention to fulfill the mission of, and therefore destroy the Jesuits, and the Weishaupt Church may have drawn from Voltaire and the Encyclopedias. Meanwhile, he graduated from the University of Ingolstadt in 1768. He served as a tutor for four years until he was promoted to assistant. The ends, according to Weishaupt, must be pursued by any means and in secret. Every initiate is told to lead his friend. This is done to form a legion, which better than Thebes is called holy and invincible. Weishaupt awakened in followers the desire for equality and freedom making them indifferent to governments. He led men of different nations and religions to a common bond, taking away the most brilliant minds from the church and the state. With this, he undermined the foundations of the states. Still moderate ideas, because for the extreme classes of wizards and kingmen, everything is matter. How many prejudices did we not find to destroy in you before being able to persuade you? How many prejudices did we not find to destroy in you before being able to persuade you that this alleged religion of Christ was nothing but the work of priests, of imposture and tyranny? If such is this gospel, so proclaimed and admired, what should we think of all the other religions? Know therefore that they all have the same fiction as their origin and are based on lies and imposture as long as they are represented by men. And not logic. God, the world, are but the same thing. All religions are inconsistent, chimerical, and inventions of ambitious men. In the instruction for the rank of regent, Weishaupt requires the Illuminati to hide under the name of another society, the lower lodges of Freemasonry, the code state, the administrative state are meanwhile the most convenient veil for our great object, because the world is already accustomed to not expecting anything big, 
and that deserves attention for Masons. It took its first rise among the Freemasons, but is totally different from Freemasons. It was not, however, the mere protection gained by the secrecy of the lodges that gave occasion to it, but it arose naturally from the corruptions that had gradually crept into the fraternity, the violence of the party spirit which pervaded it, and from the total uncertainty and darkness that hangs over the whole of that mysterious association. Robeson. Why would the Illuminati choose a Masonic secret society already organized? Because it would be madness, replied Bode, their champion from North Germany playing with your cards face up when your opponent hides your game. Anna and Lucas music homepage. The next saint is Molinos, Miguel de Molinos, 1640 to 1697, Anno Domini, by Tao Abirion. Spanish priest and mystic, the chief exponent of quietism, he studied theology at Valencia, moving to Rome after his ordination. Quietism is a form of religious mysticism influenced by Neoplatonism, which requires extinction quieting of the personal will. Fana. In passive contemplation to allow infusion of the divine will. Boko. Molinus believed that his doctrine of quietism was the only way to Christian perfection. Molinus wrote the spiritual guide, 1675, which is included in the Liber E and AA Section 1 reading list and is required reading for entry to the probationer level of AA. Crowley describes it as a simple manual of Christian mysticism. It causes an immediate sensation on its publication. It caused an immediate sensation on its publication and was popular among Protestants as well as Roman Catholics. In 1685, Anno Domini, at the height of his popularity, Molinos was arrested by the papal police, tried and eventually sentenced to life imprisonment for heresy. The way to inner peace shown by Molinos in the spiritual guide is fourfold. One, prayer. Two, obedience. Three, frequent communion. And four, inward mortification. Molinos does not advocate withdrawal from the external affairs of life, but characterizes performance of one's ordinary calling if it is done with inner concentration and devotion to the divine will as virtual prayer. Practice progresses from meditation through contemplation to passive infused contemplation, a state wherein contemplation is habitual and continuous. Molinos eschewed speculation on or longing for the Godhead as well as external mortifications as being too involved with the personal will. He saw obedience as necessary to the contemplative life, as a corrective to the tendency of the personal will to reassert its dominance. His arrest was a result of a campaign against him by the Jesuits, who 
viewed the internalizing doctrines of quietism as not only a threat to the established practices and temporal ambitions of the church, you see, but also as leading to antinomianism. When the personal will is extinguished, so the doctrine goes, the devil can temporarily make himself master of the contemplative's body and force him to perform acts which would seem, out of context, to be sins, like the melamia. However, the real sin, according to quietism, would consist in reasserting the personal will by consciously resisting the promptings of the devil. The devil made me do it. References, Jackson, Samuel, Macaulay, Editor-in-Chief, The New Chef Herzog, Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, Baker Book House, Grand Rapids, Michigan, 1953. Molinos, Miguel de, The Spiritual Guide, a reprint of the edition of 1699. George W. McCullough, Philadelphia, 1911. Original publication date, 1995. Updated, 2197. Originally published in Red Flame No. 2, Mystery of Mystery, a primer of Thelemic Ecclesiastical Gnosticism by Tao Apirion and Helena. Berkeley, California, 1995. Anno Domini. The next saint is Elias Ashmol, 1617 to 1692, Arab Vogadis, by Tao Apirion, English antiquarian, historian, alchemist, astrologer, and Freemason founder of what is now the Ashmolean Collection of the British Museum at Oxford, founding member of the Royal Society and author of Theatrum Chimicum Britannicum, 1652, and the Institution, Laws and Ceremonies of the Most Noble Order of the Garter, 1672. The writer, if I'm not mistaken, well, never mind. Ashmole was a late but ardent student of John Dee, whose manuscripts he possessed, and an apologist for Rosicrucianism. Some historians believe that Ashmole was the actual founder of speculative Freemasonry and that he based the fraternity on ideas from Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. Wonderful strange. References, Mackey, Albert G. Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, Masonic History Co., New York, 1909. Macintosh, Christopher, The Rosicrucians, The History and Mythology of an Occult Order, Crucible, Wellingboro, 1987, Yates, Francis, The Rosicrucian, Enlightenment, Arc, London, 1972, 1986, Rola, Stanislaus, Klosowski, De, The Golden Game, Alchemical Engravings of the 17th Century, George Braziller, Inc., New York, 1988, original publication date 1995, updated 2197, originally published in Red Flame No. 2, Mystery of Mystery, a primer of Thelemic Ecclesiastical Gnosticism by Tao Apirion and Helena, Berkeley, California, 1995, Era Vulgaris. Another saint and potential relative of the speaker, Thomas Vaughn, 
1622-1665, Era Vulgatus, by Tal Apirion. Welsh alchemists, cabalists, and Rosicrucian apologists. He was born at Janet Freyd on the Usk, the brother of the well-known poet Henry Vaughan. Thomas Vaughan translated the Fama Fraternitatis and Confessio Fraternitatis into English and wrote a number of important magical and alchemical works under the pseudonym Eugenius Thiele Lettis. He was killed by an explosion during an alchemical experiment or, as some say, by an overdose of the elixir. His works include Anthrosophia, Theomagia, A Discourse of the Nature of Man and His State After Death, 1650, Anima Magia, Abscondita, A Discourse of the Universal Spirit of Nature, 1650, Magia, Aramica, The Antiquity of Magic, 1650, Coelum Terra, Coelum Terre, The Magician's Heavenly Chaos, Unfolding a Doctrine Concerning the Terrestrial Heaven, 1650, Lumen de Lumen, Lumen de Lumin, A Magical Light, Lumen de Lumin, A New Magical Light, 1651, Ola Lucis, The House of Light, 1651, The Fame and Confession of the Fraternity of the Rose Cross, 1652, and Euphrates, The Waters of the East, 1655. References, Macintosh Christopher, The Rosicrucians, The History and Mythology of an Occult Order, Crucible, Wellingboro, 1987, Rigardi, Israel, The Philosopher's Stone, 1970, Llewellyn Publications, St. Paul, Minnesota, 1978, Waite, Arthur Edward, The Real History of the Rosicrucians, London, 1887, Waite, Arthur Edward, Editor, The Works of Thomas Vaughan, University Books, New York, 1968, Yates, Francis, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, Arc, London, 1972-1986. Original publication date, 1995. Updated, 2197. Originally published in Red Flame No. 2, Mystery of Mystery, a Primer of Thelemic Ecclesiastical Gnosticism by Tal Apirion and Helena. Berkeley, California, 1995, Era Vulgatus. Our next saint is Sir Edward Kelly, 1555-1595, Era Vulgatus, by Tao Apirion. Irish alchemist and magician, Kelly is best known for his travels with John Day, and work his work for Day as a scryer or visionary medium, but he was also a noted alchemist on his own right, publishing three alchemical works, The Stone of the Philosophers, The Humid Way, and The Theater of Terrestrial Astronomy. Kelly's personality is somewhat of a mystery. He was born Edward Talbot, in Worcester and attended Oxford for a few years, but did not obtain a degree. He seems to have practiced as a notary for a number of years in London or Lancaster. In Wells, he appears to have chanced upon, under rather mysterious circumstances, the sole copy of the Book of St. Dunstan an alchemical treatise which explains how to formulate the red and white powders for the transmutation of metals, along with two ivory caskets containing samples of these powders. 
he is alleged to have used these powders to make gifts of gold for his friends and to impress John Day. There is a poorly substantiated tradition that he wore his characteristic black skull cap to disguise the fact that his ears had been cut off for forgery. Most non-magician historians view him as a charlatan who took advantage of Day's credulity, leading him along the puzzling, leading him along with puzzling clues to arcane knowledge. So they accused him of being one of the angels he claimed to be scrying. And yet, Day seems to have driven Kelly to the brink of insanity, forcing him to perform long scrying sessions on a nearly daily basis. Kelly expressed his fear and mistrust of the spirits on a number of occasions. In addition, the materials received in the workings was in an angelic language with its own unique grammar and syntax some of it being remarkably consistent in betraying substantial knowledge and intelligence. It is written in a strange yet magnificent sort of prophetic poetry which possesses remarkable power and dark beauty. In chapter 187 of Liber Aleph, Crowley says that an angel did declare unto Kelly the very axiomata of our law of Thelema, in good measure and plainly, but day afflicted by the fixity of his tenets that were of the slave gods was wroth, and by his authority prevailed upon the other, who was indeed not wholly perfected as an instrument or the world ready for that sowing. The particular transmission to which Crowley probably refers is recorded in Day's diary for June 8, 1584. Day states that the spirits attempted to persuade Kelly that Jesus was not God that no prayer ought to be made to Jesus, that there is no sin, that man's soul doth go from one body to another, child's quickening or animation, that as many men and women as are now have always been. Sifr that the generation of mankind from Adam and Eve is not an history, but a writing which has another sense. No Holy Ghost, they acknowledged. They would not suffer him to pray to Jesus Christ, but would rebuke him, saying that he robbed God of his honor, etc., Why have you come here to persecute us, O oh, Jesus, Son of God? Get thee out of him, he said. For the man possessed by legion. The cosmological system received by Day and Kelly bears numerous resemblances to older Gnostic systems. Two late Gnostic works, the book of Yao, were attributed to authorship of Enoch, they are of his father Seth. The system of 30 Aethers, developed by Day and Kelly, could easily be classified as a Gnostic aenology. They are numerous other examples. There are numerous other examples. One of the most striking is the following passage obtained by Day and Kelly on May 23, 1587. I am the daughter of fortitude.
uh, to 11. And ravaged every hour from my youth. For behold, I am understanding, and science dwelleth in me. And the heavens oppress me. They covet and desire me with infinite appetite. Few are none that are earthly have embraced me. For I am shadowed with the circle of the stone and covered with the morning clouds. My feet are swifter than the winds, and my hands are sweeter than the morning dew. My garments are from the beginning, and my dwelling place is in myself. The lion knoweth not where I walk, for I walk within him. Neither do the beasts of the field understand me, I am deflowered and yet a virgin. I sanctify and am not sanctified. Happy is he that embraceth me, for in the night season I am sweet, and in the day full of pleasure. My company is a harmony of many symbols. Cling. And my lips sweeter than health itself. I am a harlot for such as ravish me, and a virgin with such as know me not. For lo, I am loved of many, and I am a lover to many. And as many as come unto me as they should do have entertainment. Purge your streets, O ye sons of men, and wash your houses clean. Make yourselves holy, and put on righteousness. Cast out your old strumpets, and burn their clothes. Abstain from the company of other women that are defiled, that are sluttish, and not so handsome as beautiful, and not so handsome and beautiful as I. Cast out your old strumpets and burn their clothes. Abstain from the company of other women that are defiled, that are sluttish, and not so handsome and beautiful as I. And then will I come and dwell amongst you, and behold, I will bring forth children unto you, and they shall be the sons of comfort. I will open my garments and stand naked before you, that your love may be more inflamed toward me. As yet I walk in the clouds, as yet I am carried with the winds, and cannot descend unto you, for the multitude of your abominations and the filthy loathsomeness of your dwelling places. Whatever else he was, Kelly was, in one sense or another, inspired. Kelly received knighthood at the hand of the Bohemian Emperor, Rudolf II, as a reward for his alchemical works. Possibly as a result of the small quantities of the red and white tinctures which he possessed. But Rudolf later imprisoned him when he failed to deliver the quantities of alchemical gold he had promised. Kelly died while attempting to escape from prison. Crowley considered Kelly to be one of his previous incarnations, a sort of Comte de Saint Germain. See chapters 73 and 187 of Liber Aleph in part three of the heart of the master references barrett francis 
the Magus, or Celestial Intelligencer, 1801, Citadel, Secaucus, New Jersey, 1967. Kosobon, Merrick, a true and faithful relation of what passed for many years between Dr. John Day and some spirits, London, 1659, reprinted by Magical Child Publishing, Inc., New York, 1992. Crowley, Alistair, The Equinox, Volume 1, London, 1910-1913, Erevogadis. Crowley, Alistair, The Heart of the Master, Ordo Templi Orientis, 1938, New Falcons Publications, Scottsdale, Arizona, 1992, Crowley, Libra Aleph, Vel, CXI, or 111, The Book of Wisdom or Folly, The Lama Publishing, 1962, Samuel Weiser, York Beach, Maine, 1991, Head Thomas, The Enochian System in the Complete Golden Dawn System of Magic, Edited by Israel Rigardi, Falcon Press, Phoenix, Arizona, 1984. James Joffrey, The Enochian Evocation of Dr. John D. Heptangle Books, Gillette, New Jersey, 1984. Laycock, Donald C., The Complete Enochian Dictionary, Askin, Publishers, London, 1978, Romer Sachs, The Romance of Sorcery, Causeway Books, New York, 1973, Turner, Robert, Elizabethan Magic, Element, Longmead, 1989, Yates, Francis, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, Arc, London, 1972-1986, Original Publication Date, 52495. Originally published in Red Flame Number no. 2, Mystery of Mystery, a Primer of Thelemic Ecclesiastical Gnosticism by Tao Apirion and Helena, Berkeley, California, 1995, Era Vulgaris. Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth I. had a royal magician whose name was Johannes Day. The next Gnostic saint, Johannes John Day, 1524, 1527 to 1608, by Tao Apirion, English alchemist, mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, philosopher, and magician. Day was the court astrologer to both Queen Mary I and Queen Elizabeth I, and according to legend, conjured a wind storm, which resulted in the defeat of the invading Spanish Armada. Day was the editor of the first English translation of Euclid's Elements. Day, along with Edward Kelly, were responsible for the Enochian system of magical intercourse with a hierarchy of angelic beings, a system of great importance in the magical technology of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and of Aleister Crowley, forming the basis for Liber, CDX V111 418 The Vision and the Voice in the Equinox Volume 1 Number 5 March 1911 and Lieber LXXXIX two fifty nine Vel Chanuk in the Equinox Volume 1 Numbers 7 and 8, March and September 1912. Some believe D to be the true instigator of the Rosicrucian movement. 
His major published work was Monis Hieroglyphica, 16, 1564, Merrick Gossabon's A True and Faithful Relation of What Passed for Many Years Between Dr. John Dee and Some Spirits, published in 1659, was a compilation of Dee's diaries during his Enochian workings with Kelly. References Barrett Francis, The Magus, or Celestial Intelligencer, 1801, Citadel Secaucus, New Jersey, 1967, Gosselbon, Merrick, A True and Faithful Relation of What Passed for Many Years Between Dr. John Day and Some Spirits, London, 1659, reprinted by Magical Child Publishing, Inc., New York, 1992, Crowley Alistair, The Equinox, Volume 1, London, 1910-1913, Arrow of a Goddess, Head Thomas, The Enochian System in the Complete Golden Dawn System of Magic, edited by Israel Rigardi, Falcon Press, Phoenix, Arizona, 1984, James Joffrey, the Enochian, the Enochian Evocation of Dr. John Day, Heptangle Books, Gillette, New Jersey, 1984, Laycock, Donald C., The Complete Enochian Dictionary, Askin, Publishers, London, 1978, Romer Sachs, The Romance of Sorcery, Causeway, New York, 1973, Turner Robert, Elizabethan Magic, Element, Long Mead, 1989, Yates, Francis, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, Ark, London, 1972 to 1986. Originally published in Red Flame No. 2, Mystery of Mystery, A Primer of Thelemic Ecclesiastical Gnosticism by Tao Apirion and Helena, Berkeley, California, 1995, Arrow Vogadis.